Good morning. Welcome to our worship service on this beautiful Tuesday morning. This is Reformation Heritage Week here at Beast Divinity School, a week we uh, commemorate every year, uh, thanking the Lord for our Reformation heritage and asking him to help us uh, receive it well and make good use of it in our daily lives and in our ministries. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Ian McFarland to our community today. Dr. McFarland is one of the most influential Lutheran theologians at work today. Uh, he comes to us from the Candler School of Theology at Emory University, where he's the Woodruff Professor of Theology. He's also an excellent Reformation scholar. It's a real treat to have him with us uh, all week long. I want to turn your attention to the little biography of Dr. McFarlane on the back of your worship bulletin, and then just make a little announcement about the proceedings of the week. Uh, this morning, of course, Dr. McFarlane is preaching on Ephesians 1, a sermon entitled, What Jesus Wouldn't Do. Intriguing. I hope you're ready to hear what he has to say about that. Uh, the series of lectures he's prepared for us this week is entitled, Not by Bread Alone, Justification and the Christian Hope. Uh, and he'll be giving lectures every day this week except Friday at 11 a.m. So tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. in N101, he'll be lecturing uh, on the Lord of Glory, and then Thursday morning at 11 a.m. in N101, which for visitors is the Slope Lecture Hall on the north side of our building, Divinity Hall. He'll be lecturing on the hope of glory. All these lectures are free and open to the public. Please invite your friends to come. Uh, please attend as you are able. Thank you, Dr. McFarlane, for being with us all week long. Reading the Holy Scripture from Ephesians chapter 1 verses 11 to 23. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, it was the guarantee of our inheritance. Uh, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all, all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all... He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today is November 1st, which in my liturgical calendar is All Saints Day which is appropriate, I think, for Reformation Heritage Week because as my own teacher of Lutheran confessions, William Lazarus, used to insist, the Reformation, as Luther understood it certainly, was a movement within the church Catholic. And if, much as I like uh, Reformation Day, um, uh, that holiday has a certain suspicious parochialism about it and it should be, in a certain sense, temporary, whereas all saints all Saints is an interesting feast. It has been celebrated by the Western Church on this date since the ninth century, and the roots of the festival go back even further. As early as the fourth century, where we have re records of churches setting aside a day to honor all Christian martyrs known and unknown. More recently, especially among churches in the Reformation traditions, all Saints has become a more general commemoration of everyone who has died in the faith. The whole of the great cloud of witnesses, not just those guys and women, but others too, 
uh, that surround us. Now, as this legacy of the Festival of All Saints suggests, there's something very natural, very natural about having a feast like this in the Christian calendar. After all, the commemoration and veneration of one's forebears is a widespread practice among human cultures that is often viewed as a religious duty. And yet that very fact perhaps should give Christians pause because the New Testament is at best uneven in its enthusiasm about celebrating those sorts of family and social ties. Somewhat disconcertingly for those keen on promoting Christianity as a religion of family values, Jesus says, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And that if anyone does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. These decidedly non-family friendly thoughts should not be taken as a sign that Christian teaches hatred of the human race, as at least some Romans once accused them of doing, but they do reflect the fact that the gospel leads Christians to look upon such ties differently than others do. In the ancient Mediterranean world, family was about securing a legacy. People married and were given in marriage to gain a kind of immortality, to guarantee the survival of one's tribe or one's name, if not of one's self. By contrast, Christians look for fulfillment to a kingdom that is not of this world, to a life of glory that has nothing to do either with one's pedigree or with one's legacy, but which depends exclusively upon God and God's promises. And from this perspective, where faith means forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, one might well suppose that when it comes to honoring our forebears, Christians should leave the dead to bury their own dead, as someone once suggested, and get on with the business of proclaiming the kingdom. After all, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And yet there are other aspects of the Christian faith that would perhaps caution against writing off a holiday like All Saints too quickly. To be sure, because no one is born a Christian, there is no ground for boasting in one's pedigree. Paul himself notes that in light of his own background, he would have a right to such boasting if anyone did, but he counted it all as lost for the sake of Christ. And yet if no one is born into the church, neither does one become a Christian by one's own efforts. Here too, boasting is excluded, not just because faith is a gift of the spirit rather than a matter of personal achievement, but also because the character of Christian faith places us in absolute and ineluctable dependence on other people. For the gospel is a message about a historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, a descendant of David, born of Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate, which means that we know his story, as we know the story of any past human life, only through the testimony given to it by other human beings. Passed on down through the years from the first century to our own. We are Christians only because the process that Paul described to the Corinthians 20 centuries ago, I delivered to you what I also have received, has been repeated in every generation from his down to our own. Each of us believes only because someone, or more likely a cluster of someones, has delivered to us what they also had first received. It follows that if the Christian life holds no place for the idea that our biological ancestry is in any sense decisive for our identity before God, there remains a different category of ancestors, namely our forebears in the faith, whom we do have cause to remember as those through whom we have heard and without whom we could not have heard the word of God. To be sure, some will have done this more notably or effectively or heroically than others, but if we believe that we are all baptized into one body, so that we, though many, are one in Christ, and that God arranges the members in the body such that even those that seem to be weaker are indispensable, then no member's contribution, however seemingly small or insignificant, is without its place in the story of salvation. And this brings us to today's scripture reading from Ephesians. 
When this letter was written, the time separating the letter's recipients from Jesus was short, just two generations, that of the author, one of those who were the first to hope in Christ, and that of his addressees, who have subsequently heard the word of truth. What unites the two groups is that they have both alike been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Neither generation can claim any merit because each has come to the knowledge of God through God's decision long before either of them came to be. And from this perspective, the sequence in which the two groups came to believe, who came first and who followed, is inconsequential, since the faith of both is equally rooted in God's eternal election. But human life is not lived in eternity, it is lived in time. And from that perspective, the sequence does make a difference for each individual's experience of the gospel. Because in time, there is a one-sided dependence of those who come to hear the gospel in the present on those who hoped in it before. And this difference is reflected in the rest of the lesson. Admittedly, Paul's perspective in these verses is different from the one adopted on All Saints Day. Paul is looking forward, addressing those who come after him, praying in thanksgiving for their faith, but still more that God would add to it by increasing in them the spirit of wisdom, of revelation, and the knowledge of him, so that they might experience more fully the riches of his glorious inheritance and the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. By contrast, because on all saints we are looking backward to those who came before us, the content of our prayers is exclusively thanksgiving. We don't need to pray that God would increase our forebears' knowledge of him or of the riches of their, of their inheritance, for as those who are now at home with the Lord, they know these things with a fullness that surpasses anything we can imagine. Yet for all the differences between those who have gone before and those who come after, Paul is emphatic that both are to be for the praise of God's glory. At first glance, this is an odd phrase because it doesn't refer to the saints praising God's glory, but rather of their being the occasion for such praise. In other words, it's not just a matter of thanking God for the saints as though once we had acknowledged our obligation to them, we might move on and forget about them. No, Paul is describing a situation where the praise of God is caused not by any vision of the divine essence, at least not before uh, the eschaton, but rather by God's work as manifest in the people that God has saved. In short, it is through other human beings, the great cloud of witnesses that surround us, that we experience a foretaste of God's glory now. What does that mean for us concretely as we seek today to honor the saints as occasions for the praise of God's glory? In order to answer that question, perhaps the best place to begin is with what it means to be a saint. For the temptation here is to homogenize, to think of all the saints as conforming to a single type. And at first blush, there seems good biblical reason to do this, because the Bible suggests that to be a saint is, among other things, to imitate Christ. Jesus teaches, I myself have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done. John 13, and Paul says explicitly, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11. But we need to be careful here, because no one would mistake Paul for Jesus. Most obviously, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, whereas Jesus explicitly instructed his followers to preach not to preach to the Gentiles. And so, mutatis mutandis for Mary Magdalene, Peter, Perpetua, Tertullian, and every other saint from the beginning down to our own day. So how does one live as a saint? Evidently, it includes imitating Christ, but how do we do that when the first thing that strikes you when looking at the saints is how different they are from Christ. Well, I want to start, and here comes the title of the sermon, by clarifying what imitating Christ doesn't mean. It doesn't mean asking, what would Jesus do? Let me be emphatic. What would Jesus do is never, ever, the proper question for Christians to ask. And I will show you why. Take a minute and think of a particularly difficult challenge 
one might face in discipleship. Perhaps it's one you yourself have experienced, or one you've read about, or perhaps you have just imagined. Everybody got one? Okay. Now, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you. He would be conceived of the Holy Ghost by the Virgin Mary, suffer under Pontius Pilate, be crucified, died, and buried. That's it. That's the answer to what would Jesus do every time. Because what Jesus would do, he has already done, praise God. He had his calling, and he fulfilled it. You too have a calling, as does every saint. And it is a different calling than Jesus. And that means that whenever you are faced with the challenge of discipleship, what you should do is something Jesus wouldn't do. Because, friends, you're not Jesus. You have your own calling. Because there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, varieties of activities, even though it is the same God who works all in everyone. We can see this in Paul's seemingly paradoxical claim, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul is certainly an imitator of Christ, but he and the rest of us are called to imitate Christ, not by trying to be a second Jesus, but rather by imitating Jesus' fidelity to his calling in their own, by showing, their, by showing uh, equal dedication to their very different callings. The saints show forth God's glory, not by trying to repeat Jesus' ministry, but by trusting Jesus to guide them in a way of discipleship that is unique to their calling and therefore has no precise parallel in anyone else's. To be sure, there are common themes, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentleness, self-control, but these fruits of the Spirit are displayed in countless, surprising, unpredictable, and even seemingly contradictory variations. And yet everyone, each in their own way, bears witness to Jesus as Lord, to the fact that it is by his power and not our own that we live. And yet, as a result of his power, it is we in all our particularity who are alive and walk in newness of life. And it's at this point that commemorating the saints differs basically from the natural human desire to honor one's ancestors. For the latter is finally an exercise in insularity, a means of marking out one's own tribe, one's own people in distinction from others, of providing a sense of belonging, of rootedness amidst the flux and uncertainty of the present age, with the idea that who I am is somehow made more secure because I can establish something about my past. Christians can, of course, act in this way, and all too often do. But when they do, they betray the gospel. Because Jesus has no interest in giving his followers that kind of security. On the contrary, he has come to upset those established ways of finding one's place in the world by setting a man against a father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and so forth. If the saints provide us a pedigree, it is rightly understood a pedigree that unsettles us, that puts us off balance, because it's a pedigree that forces us to consider ways of being that do not conform to the expectations of family or clan or culture or even the church. And that's why the gospel lesson, in the gospel lesson, which we didn't read today for all saints, Jesus pronounced blessed precisely those who do not conform to worldly standards of success or excellence, the poor, the hungry, the sorrowful, and all who are hated, excluded, and reviled for the sake of his name. It is often said that we look to the saints as examples, and this is true enough. But the example that we are to copy, as those who, like them, seek to be imitators of Christ, is not their particular vocation which is theirs and theirs alone. What we imitate is rather their faithfulness to that vocation, which means finally their persistence in seeking to be just the persons that Christ has called them to be and none other. 
For it is the way of faith that precisely because Jesus is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, that it is in living out our own vocations, in asking what Jesus wouldn't do, but that we should, that we become the most like Jesus. And so we remember the saints, not in order to indulge in romance or sentimentality or Christian tribalism, but precisely so that in holding before us their faithfulness, we too might have the courage to persevere in our several callings, to which we have been called so that we, with them, might be a sign of the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, to the praise of his glory. Amen. <laughs>